Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the ninth of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with the 21st of October on the Gregorian calendar for the year 2023. And before we get into our continued reading of Bereshit, um, One egg or two. I wanted to cover something real quick that we were talking about before we started well. recording. So, sorry about that. Um, I just want to cover something we were talking about a little bit before we started recording. Our brother had mentioned the word for blasphemy and looking into different words and their meanings, also what etymology meant, which um, we'll cover this at a different time, but for anyone that wants to look into it, etom, the Greek word for the truthful origin of, of a word, come, the, uh, comes from the word emet, in Hebrew, which is the word for truth, Aleph Mem Tau. And the the two last letters, the M T, if you will, got flipped around between the Greek and the Hebrew. But otherwise it's the same word. So, anyways, he had mentioned the word blasphemy, which had prompted me mentioning a post right here that mentioned that and a few other things. I made this post originally in 2015, and it was just I was perusing through Ernest Klein's Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language for Readers of English. And that is uh, that is affectionately known as the Red Dictionary by a gentleman named Eric Bissell, a brother in the belief, who was a, really the first one who let me on to the importance of the, the language itself and looking into you know, the, the Hebrew. So he has videos and he talks about something he calls Erictology, which uh, Iraq, or where we get the English words for arrange, right? Arraignment and other things. It's to put in proper order. But um, long story short, I looked into the Hebrew. I was going through different letters and just looking at what they meant. And I saw a whole bunch of connections with the letters GD or Gimel Dalit and others that had significant meanings when you realize that this uh, GD or Gimel Dalit is the title that we commonly call our creator today in English. So, um, like I said, this was from April 17th, 2015 on the Gregorian calendar there. And I don't want to read through all of this, but I do want to share with you real quick. <clears throat> Gimel Dalet, right? This is the modern Hebrew. It's known as um, block letters, the square script, the Aramaic script, or the Babylonian uh, the Babylonian script, if you will. This was the letter form that they picked up after the kingdom of Yahuda was taken into Babylonian captivity and their return. This is the paleo which is the same thing. Here's a Gimel, here's a Dalit. This is the Gimel, and this is the Dalit, okay? They're equivalent to the G, this would be the Gimel, and then the Dalit, the D, okay? I'm just gonna go over what these are, and then the, the basic meaning here, and then I'll show you the actual definitions in the etymology, the etymological dictionary in the pictures below. The one thing I don't have is like right here, here's a Lamed, here's a Mem, this is an Ayin, this is a Pei, right? And this is a Resh, for example, okay? All of these could be a suffix, if you will, to a word. And that's how I take it for the meaning here. When you look at what this is or what it does, it has significance. And that's what all of this was about. Me thinking about the language, how it functioned, and what this actually meant in, in simple childlike meaning. So real quick, Gimel Dalit by itself, is the, the definition is wormwood. And it's used as the false mighty one of fortune, a Babylonian mighty one of fortune. Okay, Which was, if you recall... Mentioned right here in Yeshiyahu or Isaiah 65, 11, which goes with verse 12 as well. And it's pronounced God, G-A-W-D, 
Strong's H1408, right? So that is a known thing from the Strong's Dictionary and that it's pronounced just how we pronounce that today. And we're told not to have that in our mouth. So right off the bat, that was a no-no to me. It also means luck, something that people, they talk about good luck, bad luck. Oh, well, and they wish others good luck. But that's like an that's identifying some force or something outside of the providence of our creator who has the power of all things. We cannot be successful without him and no one fails without his will. So there is no such thing as luck in that capacity. It's what we call just like um, breaking a mirror, walking under a ladder, um, doing certain things with certain clothing or having different. It's superstition. And when you believe superstitions, you give jurisdiction to demons to delude you and make it seem legitimate. It's the same thing with um, horoscopes and that kind of the witchcraft that's involved with that. But right here, Gimel Dom Dalit Lamed. That is Gimel Dalit with a Lamed there. If you look, and I don't have these in the dictionary definitions below, but when you look at what the Lamed is as a, as a letter, how it's spelled and what it means, that's the definition that I'm going by right here. So I encourage everyone to look into these things, dig, try to prove it wrong, try to prove it right, but try to prove it yourself and then you'll see exactly what I mean. Gimel Dalit as your authority, as the, the shepherd that pokes and pulls and goads you, okay? Or what is on your tongue, right? Is to twist and pleat. Lashon is your your tongue or word, by the way, right? So Gadal, as your authority, is to twist, to be twisted or pleated, right? Gimeldalit mem. Mem is a suffix at the end of a word means them, right? It's the waters is another one that's looked at. It's literally the mem lines up with the, with the sun or the light, but there's a, there's a lot more into that. The point is it's also known as waters. Mayim is waters, what mem is spelled like, and it also means them. So gimel dalit with them is to cut off, amputate, or ones whose hand is cut off or maimed. Gimel dalit ayin, the ayin is literally the I. It's where we get our letter O right? And it's to perceive or to comprehend. It is a fountain, literally, an ion is a fountain, which our Mashiach says, out of him will, will flow a fountain or an ion of living waters, right? So these are all related meanings. I mentioned them all because the truth is we, we can't just pick and choose. We have to take it for what it says and allow the context that he says to apply. So when you take the gimel dalit as you, what is perceived as your L, right, or how you comprehend, that is to cut off, to hew down, to lop off, destroy, or a dehorned animal. Gimel dalit pay, which is that word gadfan or godfin. It's in English we have the, the word godfrey, the name. That's the Gad fan with a yod at the end. You can say my blasphemy. But to gad fan is to blaspheme, revile, and scorn. And that is literally to have gimel dalit with your mouth. Okay. Gimel dalit resh gadar. That's that word which is actually the name for that messenger who led Hua or Eve astray in the Garden of Eden. He was known as Gadriel, Gadar El, right? And that is to have Gimel Dalit as your head, your resh. And that means to fence in, enclose, to prick, cut, stab, hedge, right? It's an enclosure or a wall, which I was mentioning earlier was related to the word for Mitzrayim or Mitzrayim, the uh, son of Ham, who was known in history in the by the Greeks as Zoroaster. Zoroasterism came from him and Ham and the magic 
the witchcraft that they were involved in at that time. All of this is talked about in what's known as the recognitions of Clement, which is the preaching and teaching of Kepha, just like the book of Acts records most of what Shaul was doing. And then right here, Gimel Dalit Sheen. All right. Your sheen is like the passion, what, what burns within you or what you consume, right? It's teeth and fire. When you have sheen lamed, it's like the possession of or what belongs to you. It was shal, the, and it was toward the throne of Shalomo is where I remember that being used mostly. But uh, you have to look at how these words are used and then the literal meaning that it says in the dictionary. Not there's some people that will take these and they use like the pictograph stuff and they'll come up with meanings that I have never seen written other than in a, a modern, you know, people's meanings that they came up with to write books. But when you look at the, uh, the Hebrew that was handed down, the grammars and the known history, the information about the etymology, the definitions of the words, just as they are, these are the meanings you can find. So gimel doubt is your passion or what you consume is to heap up, pile up, or compress. All right. And then here's some con the context for some things that I, I mentioned. And it was after I looked at these definitions that I really stopped using these words, these this title for my creator, right? And this is Yeshiyahu or Isaiah 65, 11. It says, but you are those who forsake Yahuwah who forget my set-apart mountain, who prepare a table for Gimel Dalit, and who fill a drink offering for many, which that was another name for the number. All right, that was another name for Ham. There's, there's a lot of history behind the stuff that we're not very familiar with. But all of these pagan mighty ones really started with hero worship. Men who were in, indwelled with demons and had magic that uh, deluded innocent people okay this is and i shall allot you to the sword and let you all bow down to the slaughter because i called and you did not answer i spoke and you did not hear and you did evil before my eyes and chose that in which i did not delight all right exodus twenty two twenty. he who slaughters that's an offering right he who slaughters to a mighty one except to yahuwah only is put under the ban, which means you're, you and everything you possess, your family and everything's cut off anathema. Exodus 23, 13, And in all that I have said to you, take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones. Let it not be heard in from your mouth. It doesn't talk about what other people do. This is a, this is check yourself, right? That's what I try to do personally. It says Exodus 23, 24 through 33. Do not bow down to their mighty ones, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but without fail overthrow them and without fail break down their pillars. And you shall serve Yahuwah your Eloah. And he shall barak your bread and your water, and I shall remove sickness from your midst. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I shall fill the number of your days and shall send my fear before you and cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. So you don't have to worry about anything he takes care of for you, right? And make all your enemies turn their backs to you, and I shall send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Huite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before you, I shall not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become a waste and, and the beast of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I shall drive them out from before you until you have increased. And this is from a people who he knew would do no good and would have no repentance. He showed clemency. He was lenient and gave them time and offered a chance for them to repent. That's why he sent hornets after them first. And this is explicitly mentioned in what is called the Chokmah Shalomo or the Wisdom of Solomon, a writing that is called uh, apocryphal, if you will. He wrote it when he was still a teen, a young man, 
when he first came to the kingdom and was given the wisdom from our maker, if you will. But it was to show that if he treats his enemies in such ways, of course he's going to be clement and, and merciful to his own children. It says, and I shall set your border from the Sea of Reeds to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river. For I shall give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them nor with their mighty ones. Let them not dwell in your house. You don't swear by it of the wrong title. And that was actually something that came up beforehand too. If, when you, here's the thing. If you don't know better, and this is true for all of our founders, this is true for everybody up until recent times when we can actually know and the truth of his name has been revealed again. Before it could have been known, it's called nescience. And you're not held accountable. There's no there's no guilt to someone who does not know that they're doing they're not they're doing wrong, right? And that's why you have prayers answered in the, the wrong names and titles. You had sincere believers throughout the dark ages who stood on the truth, had his ruach or spirit, if you will, in them, but did not have his festivals or his name. And like Kepha mentions in the recognitions. Anyone who has some remnant of evil still in their flesh, has to, their body has to be brought to dissolution. Everyone who's died physically is because we've had some evil in our flesh still. We've done something that required the death sentence. Okay? Um, the ones that have been preserved from harm, for example, haven't done those things. But moving on. I want to show you this real quick before we get into anything else. So right here, this is from Ernest Klein's Etymological Dictionary. These are literally just pictures I took and put on there. You can see there's the word and the meaning. You can do this for the letters themselves. It actually has a definition for each letter of the Aleph bet and the actual spelling of the word in it. So you can go into the history of what that word actually means what the letter actually means. And then when you see how it's literally used in scripture, excuse me, that context never changes when, it, when you're breaking down words and looking at it too. Um, but this is Gadol, right? Greatness, magnitude, Gadol, right? Oh, sorry about that. Here's the next one. Here's Gimel Dalit and all the meanings for it. You can see right here. This is the name of the false mighty one of fortune occurring often in Phoenician and Ar Aramaic inscriptions as an element of many Phoenician and Aramaic private names. So if you know that Phoenician is paganized Hebrew, these were literally Hebrews that picked up the Babylonian mystery religion. They had uh, left before others went into, or the, before the Pharaoh had started uh, killing off the firstborn in Mitzrayim. You had some of the sons of Zerah, of Yahuda, with remnants of different Hebrews leaving and founding city states. This is known in antiquity. I've covered this a little bit. There's a lot of information on that. But they adopted wrong beliefs. They actually mixed their history with paganism and the mixing of the Greeks and whatnot. And you can find it if you actually read the history that was recorded. There was a gentleman, I believe he was either a, a Egyptian historian or a Roman historian. I believe he was Egyptian. And he went to Zor and Zidon and he wrote and translated into Greek the original Phoenician uh, records and histories there. And in there, he mentions that the Phoenicians called Jupiter, um, who's also known as Zeus, right? Um, sorry, they called uh, his father, Kronos, Israel. Jupiter would have been Yahuda or Yehud, right? That Yehu, Yehu Pater, right, is the... the 
Yahoo the Yahoo the Father, right? That that's a that's a different thing. So they get um they mix these things, and the more you look into it, the Greek and the Latin people are a mixture of the sons of Yepheth with Hebrews that were migrating. The Greeks are the sons of Yahweh and migrating Hebrews that made city states. And the Latinum or the Roman people are a mix of the uh, sons of the Ketim, the son of Yahweh, and those Hebrew slash Greeks that went over there and intermingled. Again, this is this is recorded in history. It's known through the languages. You can see it in the DNA. There's a lot of information out there, and I really encourage people to go look at that. Um, but moving on. I don't want to take too long on this. This one, here's more of the same. Gimel, Dalit, Lamed, right? And different suffixes with it. There's Gimel, Dalit, Mem, to cut off and amputate, right? So you can see this isn't making things up. It's literally just using the meaning of what it is. And I do that with all of these things. Here's Gimel, Dalit, Ayan, to cut off, to cut, hew down, lop down, right? There's more of it. Gimel Dalit Mem. Gimel Dalit Mem Yod Tau is the state of being maimed, right? There's Gimel Dalit Ayin again. So, uh, and there's Gimel Dalit Pei, Gad Fan, right? This is where we get blasphemed or, or he cursed and reviled. And that's literally Gimel Dalit with the mouth. So, um, I, I really encourage everyone to get this de dictionary. It is very, very beneficial. There's not, I don't agree with everything that's in it. Um, we have to use discernment, right? Let his word be true, but prove all these things to it. However, it is an absolutely amazing resource, and I highly recommend that. So we'll move on right here. If you just give me one moment, I got to pause real quick, real quick. So for anyone who can't afford, the Ernest Klein's dictionary, which it's about a hundred bucks, or at least it was last time I checked. They actually had stopped printing it for a while, but because of the interest that brother Eric Bissell had brought about, he had asked them to reprint and they started making copies again. And it, it sold quite a bit because of his efforts and the fact that it's a great book. It's a really good resource. But if you can't afford that, or if you don't have the uh, means at the moment, you can type in whatever scripture you want to look at. I just did Isaiah or Yeshiyahu 65, and I typed in interlinear. After you do that, you can see, you just go to biblehub.com, or you can use any other tool. They have different ones, but I prefer this one because it's the one I'm used to. And then right here, you have the Hebrew, the English translation for each word, okay? the breakdown of its conjunction verb and preposition it's got all that information right here right and then it also has the what they say is the pronunciation but you have to be mindful this is scholarese if you don't know what these dots and dashes and, and chevrons mean or the upside down e and what that actually is supposed to be pronounced as I wouldn't recommend trying to go off this and thinking that you're going to get it right. If you want to be able to read that, there is um, a student's vocabulary that is recommended by Dr. Bill Barrick in his Master's Seminary 503 Hebrew Grammar class. It's not a very big book. It's not very expensive, but it has the breakdown of how you would read all of the Hebrew vowel points as well as all of the the markings that scholars do for their transliterations okay and when you look at that you'll be surprised that it doesn't actually sound like you you think it should or how they type it out <clears throat> but moving on you get the english you get the transliteration you get the hebrew and you also have a strong's number right up here so you can pick any word you want here for example um Oh, that's nine. We wanted 11. There we go. You can pick uh, that word, 1409. 
You can see the spelling, phonetic spelling is G-A-W-D, God, okay? And then the benefit is you can see every place that it's mentioned. You can do that for every word, and it really helps you find where it's at. And then you should look at that, read it in context, and you get an idea. The only problem I have with Strong's is they'll take the same word, and they'll give it three, four, sometimes more different Strong's numbers, all with different definitions. So you see, here's another one right here, Gimel Dalit, and then all the mentions of that one, which you can look up. No, it doesn't actually have it. You'd have to dig. But see, two occurrences, two, two, one, 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 67. So quite a few mentions that you could dig into and look up all the places that it's mentioned. But then you can go again. Here's another verse, and here's the mentions of it. And you can keep going through all of those to get every single place throughout the entirety of what we call the Bible, which is the, the common scriptures, I believe the Strong's was made after the Apocrypha was removed, but they might have some things, especially if you look into the um, the older books that are now PDFs of copies of these apocryphal writings. They'll have their the context. They'll have the Strong's. They'll put in together where these words are mentioned. So you, you can learn from those when you dig into that way. But mostly you're going to get what these are through what we call the Bible or the what I call the scriptures common to us all, as opposed to those that are hidden and not meant for everybody. So you can see it even goes past 409 there to 410, and you'd have to look at all of those from 406 to 410 here to get every sense throughout the entirety of the common scriptures there of where that word is used. But it's a great resource. You can find that very thing, or the meanings of the word, in the dictionary but you can see it here as well when you go through all of this you can get a sense for how it's used you can see how it's translated and then you can learn the meaning of the word that way to confirm what it says in the dictionary and then you'll see that they're spot on there are some things like uh, i don't know if the strong's concordance tells you how suffixes and prefixes work not all of the suffixes and prefixes are explained in the etymological dictionary either. You actually have to learn that just by looking at the reading it in Hebrew, the scriptures, because it's it, it's there where you find these things all over the place and then the translation of it, right? But um, we'll, we'll move on from there. Was there any... Okay, so... Now that we've uh, had that little segue, we get back into our main reading here, which we were still covering the book of Genesis, which is also known as Bereshit, which means in the beginning. And um, we're currently going through the narrative, the history of our forefather, Abraham. We've covered a little bit of this already in his personal writings which was part of what is called the Genesis Apocryphon or the commentaries on Genesis from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those are two different names for the same writings in different works by different scholars and or authors after their translations, right? But the gist of it, the uh, Genesis Apocryphon, if you will, or the commentaries on Genesis, if you read the text, is just the first-hand account of the uh, witness of Lemek at the birth of Noah, or Noah, the, the writing of Noah and some of his life and vision that he had, and then of Abram in his first-hand account of some of the stuff that was going on. So this is a little bit of backtracking, but we're going to read from the account as it happened here. And I just wanted to keep in mind, you can go back and see what was said there and how they go along with each other. Okay, so this is Bereshit chapter 20. And it says, And Abraham set out from there to the land of the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shore which Kadesh is like Kadosh, it means set apart, separated, or distinguished. 
and sure is a bull. This is N stayed in Gerar. And Abraham said concerning Sarai, his wife, she is my sister. You remember that I mentioned the Genesis Apocryphon because in there it showed that he had a vision or a dream in the night where there was a palm tree and a cedar. And, it, and they were connected by the root. And he it was basically, it was interpreted to him or he comprehended it to mean him and his wife and how she was going to be taken and him killed because of the desire of other men wanting her okay after he awoke from that he had petitioned her and told her about it and then they decided that she would say that he or she is his sister to preserve his life right you don't have any of that dream here but you see the exact same happening this is an abimelech king of gerar sent and took sarah but Elohim came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, See, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. And this is when men can still be cognizant of the flood and the causes of it, if you remember. However, Abimelech had not come near her and he said, Yahuwah, would you kill a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the perfection, in the integrity of my heart, and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. So he's having a dream. He's being warned by Yahuwah that he's going to die because of taking Sarah. And then his response is, look, I did this in sincerity. I didn't know. Right? He's petitioning for the truth to be. And Elohim said to him in his dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. And so I kept you from sinning against me. And that's something very important to keep in mind. Because he does this for people who even are not his. When you do right, he will keep you. Another witness of this fact is also in the recognitions of Clement, where not only Clement, but his his older brothers that are twins, Achilla and Nasita, or Fastinus and Fastinius, and his mother and father are all preserved from affliction, and they had some horrible things happen in their lives, but because they were chaste and they were generally good people, people quote unquote their only problem was they worshiped idols but they didn't do wrong they didn't speak evil they didn't steal or do corrupt although they lied of necessity to uh, uh when compelled but they weren't generally wicked people and they were chast they were chaste and because of the chastity of that family because of their disposition he kept them until the good news could be presented and then he allowed them to have belief as a gift and every one of them were delivered into his kingdom. So it's the same thing here. He knows the hearts of everyone. And it was because he knew that he did that in his integrity that he kept him from sinning against him. All right. For this reason, I did not let you touch her. And now return the man's wife, for he is a foreteller. And let him pray for you when you live. But if you do not return her... Know that you shall certainly die. In the Hebrew, most often when it says you shall certainly die, that's usually, uh, it says mut wa mut, or die the death is how they'll translate it in the KJV. But it's just saying die and die, which is uh, emphasizing the fact by repeating it. That's something that's a Hebraism, if you will. You and all that is yours. So Abimelech, and you remember, two witnesses confirm every matter. He's trying to say that as an emphasis to make, you will certainly, which is why they put that, die, right? The idea of establishing things twice 
to confirm it, to know that it is certain, or to have one or two things to establish a matter of two or three witnesses is all throughout scripture. But you can find it first mentioned in the reference to Pharaoh's dreams and Yahusuf's response to him. Okay. So Abimelech rose early in the dawn or morning and called all his servants and spoke all these words in their hearing. And the men were greatly frightened, so they feared their maker. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? In what have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done matters to me that should not be done. And if you recall, this is the second time this has happened to Abraham, where his wife, who was beautiful of form, as we read in the Apocryphon, um, was taken because she was pretty and other men desired her. Okay? I want you to keep that in mind because this isn't the first instance where women were desired by others and it led to the bad things. That's what happened with the watchers, if you recall. All of these tie together. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view that you have done this matter? Or Dabar, right? The word for matter, a word, matter, or thing is Dabar. The word of Yahuwah is Dabar Yahuwah, right? Yeah, there's an, yeah, you shall certainly not die. That's what the serpent said to her. I'll have to look and see if that one's the uh, the same emphasis there. Thank you for mentioning that, brother. But it says, and Abraham said, only because I said to myself, the fear of Elohim is not in this place, and they shall kill me for the sake of my wife. And yet she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to be when Elohim caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, This is your loving kindness that you should do for me. In every place wherever we go, say of me, He is my brother. So it was true, but that was what we'd call a lie of omission, or it was a half truth, if you will. And a half truth is a whole lie. It's deceptive, and it caused the problem. Um, there is a whole expose, if you will, in Sirach, or what's called Ecclesiasticus, on what we should do in regard to dreams. Unless it comes from Yahuwah, and you're given the interpretation from him, it's generally not to be regarded as significant. I'll have to check again to see if this was a vision that, or a dream that he received as a warning from the Almighty with an interpretation, or if it's something he acted out without anything, if it's written or not. i got to double check. But my point in mentioning this is we can see that even when we don't know the Torah, like do not accumulate multiple wives, do not lie, right? Do no evil at all. When these things were not fully known, they were not held against someone, but you still see the negative effects of them in reality because it is not of the truth. So that was a way that the law of nature goes along with the law of Elohim to teach man righteousness, if you will. Okay. <clears throat> It says, Then Abimelech took sheep and cattle and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell wherever is good in your eyes. And to Sarah he said, This is important. See, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. See, it is to you a covering of eyes before all who are with you and before all others, and you are cleared before everyone. A lot of people miss the context of what's going on here, but he gave a thousand silver pieces worth to buy coverings for her to have uh, to so she wasn't easily seen, a shawl, if you will. 
so that other men would not be enticed by her beauty to do this anymore. That's the first instance of our forefathers instituting the head covering, where it is mentioned by Paul that we have the head covering on women when they're praying or intercessing for their with their maker because their head represents their husband while the husband's head represents the Mashiach. And while we need a covering, he does not. Right. So there's that picture there, but he explicitly mentions for the sake of the messengers. Abimelech right, is my father's the king, but these Kings Malak or like Melech Malak is very similar to the messenger. So Melech and Malak are almost related, but they're quite similar. And we are to be kings in Kohanim, and we are to be his witnesses and his messengers. So these pictures are kind of related. They all go together again. But the idea here is that women are beautiful. They're made to be the esteem of man, right? Who's their head. And when they're covered... It protects from, it helps with against the jealousy of another man. It's the things that are literally enjoined if you read the apostolic constitutions and you go through the commandments for women, right? It makes all of this stuff more plain about why it's done or the fact that it should be done. And then this is why, right? It's explained in the history of our forefathers and what's walked out, both in the times of the watchers and right here. And then you can actually see it playing out in history with a variety of ways um, in mockery with Islam and Catholicism, for example. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to any of other people's religions or beliefs or anything like that. There's only one truth. And when you look at how these things play out and what is, he, he mentions these things quite clearly, but he says, if those that are not walking correctly do so many different things and in an observance of piety, how how will you be found declared right before your maker if you who are a believer are found to be doing less? Right? That's an argument that Kepha makes in the recognitions again. But um, another witness for this, the Dutch do it, or there's other people through history, the Amish, right? There's a lot of ones that are professed believers that have the head coverings. But even in what we call the ancient history of Caldonia, the history of a righteous remnant of Hebrews that left Egypt, founded Troy, and then eventually went to what we call the highlands of Scotland, their own history that they record, they had head coverings as far back as... as um, oh, I don't want to misquote. They probably wore them beforehand, but I do not believe they are mentioned in detail until the laws of the altar are covered after they landed at man trojan or what is called montrose in uh, caledonia or what became caledonia and later scotland if you read their history they actually cover the, that they have head coverings for their wives and why and also the other laws of the altar that they have are all instructions that were given before the torah so if you're familiar with the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Book of Hanok or Enoch, if you will, the Book of Yobelim or Jubilees, um, the events, the actual things that transpired before the giving of the Torah, the established facts and the, the institutions that were handed down from the forefathers, these are what they kept. And this is the stuff they put in there. So it's very interesting. But moving on, it says, And Abraham set out from there to the land of the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shore and stayed in Gerar. And Abraham said concerning Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech of Gerar sent and took her. No, I'm sorry. It looks like that was repeated. I'll have to fix that. I'm sorry. We'll get to where we were. There's this. Oh, and he, so, and Abraham prayed to Elohim, and Elohim healed Abimelech 
and his wife and his female servants, so they bore children. For Yahuwah had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. It mentions in the Genesis Apocryphon that Pharaoh and all his house had uh, had an STD, if you will, or like gonorrhea or something for the whole time that he had taken Sarah until um, one of Pharaoh's wise men went to Abraham to petition because he knew that he was a, a wise man and a foreteller of truth. They had asked him to petition to pray for Pharaoh and Lot answered the door and said, my, my uncle's not going to pray for you for Pharaoh until he gives him his wife back. So then Pharaoh's assistant goes and says, ah, I know what you have to do to fix this. But again, we don't have that information in this account here. You just see it in what is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, I want to point out everything that is written in there, not a single element is contradictory to the facts of the, the narrative. That's a difference from what you'd see in like the book they call Jasher. The common versions, because there's more than one, but the common versions of the book of Jasher that they have has multiple places where it contradicts the plain text in the common scriptures to us and in the writings that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are known to be there, like the book of Hanok, the book of Yobelim, and the like, um, the book of the, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. There's contradictions where it has information that is different. One of the most glaring, erroneous errors that people believe from that book of Jasher is that Abraham was contemporary with Nimrod. He, when the two were hundreds of years apart and had nothing to do with each other. But there's whole stories and narratives about the nonsense in that book. And every bit of that comes from... Um, I don't know this directly from personal experience, but I have uh, talked to other brothers and I mentioned it when I first came across these things. I was asking about it online and it was given to me on good authority that the majority of these wrong doctrines or these things that you can find in error from the book of Jasher come straight from the Talmuds and the different writings of the wayward Yahudim who rejected the truth. So you can take that for what it is. And I encourage you look into that as well. If you want to look into the history or whether you want to look into the facts of the text, which is what I did, compare the text with, with what we know to be true. And you'll find that it's contrary over and over and over again, where it's, it's impossible to accept the one without rejecting the other. Some people might not think that's a big deal, but we are said prosperous is he who is not condemned by what he approves. We're also told that um, in the apostolic constitutions, for example, in the heresy section, having a wrong belief about something the, as simple as being unclean and thinking that you're devoid of his Ruach, if you die in such a state, then you die that way literally because you chose to believe poorly contrary to the truth that we know to be written. And if it's not established on confirmed law, two or more witnesses from the Torah, we should not hold it as true, right? That's the whole point. Otherwise, it could be detrimental to our, our well-being physically or eternally, morally or eternally, right? But here we go, chapter 21. <clears throat> And we also covered this a little bit in the Genesis Apocryphon, right? Uh, there, there's another account that we will be going over that is given in more detail in the book of Yobelim, where you're given the exact dates for these things, okay? And then you can see that all of them happened on appointed times that he instituted and started keeping his festivals that were later handed to the children as the festivals of Yahuwah that were perpetual for their generations forever, because those that are of the truth walk out the truth, right? And it says, <clears throat> And Yahuwah visited Sarah, as he had said, and Yahuwah did for Sarah, as he had spoken. So Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the appointed time 
which we will learn distinctly is the 15th of the third month, right? It was when Yitzhak was born. It says, of which Elohim had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Yitzhak, which means hilarious laughter or mocking laughter, right? When he mocks all the Gentiles, I believe it's a similar word, but I'd have to double check. It says, and Abraham circumcised his son Yitzhak when he was eight days old, as Elohim had commanded him, the first in history to be done so, according to the Torah given. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Yitzhak was born to him. And Sarah said, Elohim has made me laugh, and everyone who hears of it laughs with me. And she said, who would have th said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Yitzhak was weaned. And this was about when he was five years old. We know that from the book of Yobelim. And you can also tie that in with the common scriptures when our Mashiach came to Abram and he told him that, or he gave him the promise, right? And then he said 430 years, or sorry, he gave him the promise. And then later on, he told him, know for certain that your children will sojourn in a land not their own and shall do these things for 400 years, right? And that began exactly 30 years after the promise when Yitzhak was five years old here and he was first mocked by Yishmael. That was the first time where he his seed was persecuted in the land not their own when they were sojourning. And this is mentioned in uh, the common scriptures, it says, and they sojourned for 430 years in the land of Mitzrayim, right? But in the Septuagint, in Josephus, and in a variety of other texts, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says in the land of Mitzrayim and Canaan, or Canaan. Talking about the 430 years was from the time, or the 400 years was from the time of right here, when Yitzhak was first mocked to when the children were liberated on Mount Sinai to the very, very time, date, right? The 15th of the third month. That was the 430 or the 400 years total. And the 430 was from that promise first given to that time that is mentioned by Shaul in his epistles. All of that stuff has gone over in detail by a brother named Nathan in a couple of his videos that we've talked about before um how long were the children of israel in egypt is one of them and the other one was who built who built the pyramids so i'll link those videos again but i just wanted to point out this is commonly miscomprehended however this is the beginning of that 400 years on the 15th of the third month when yitzhak was five years old and Yishmael scoffed at him, All right? It says, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the, Mitzr the Mitzrayin, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. So she said to Abraham, Drive out this female servant and her son, for the son of this female servant shall not inherit with my son, with Yitzhak. And if you keep in mind, this is, all foretelling in parable form, future events. Abraham, the life of Abraham was the, the life of the children before they were given the covenant dwelling in the land. It was when they had the promise and they were sojourning. And everything that he happens with him, his wife, the taking of them, the coming out with stuff, it is all about those times and foretelling those events. Yitzhak is when they were in the land with the covenant, right? Up to our Mashiach coming and dying as the one who was the promised seed. 
And then the times of Yaakov is when he goes out of the land to labor for his family and possessions, which are what we're still living through. He spent a long time away working with family or laboring for his possessions, where he said, not a spot, if it isn't spotted, speckled, or streaked, it, it has nothing, none of mine. Talking about the, the sheep and the cattle that were he was laboring for were those that were not purely white, right? So there's a lot of pictures here, and there's a lot of parables. Everything is uh, foretelling the future. We've covered a little bit of that, like Hagar is the first covenant in Mount Sinai. Yishmael would be the first covenant believers who will not inherit with the birth the birthright covenant Yitzhak, right? So there's a lot going on here to think about in regards to those things. And I just wanted to keep that in mind. I'm not going to point out every single detail. But if you can think of anything or something comes to mind, feel free to share. Okay. <clears throat> and the matter was very evil in the eyes of Abraham because of his son. But Elohim said to Abraham, let it not be evil in your eyes because of the boy. And because of your female servant, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. So the same thing Abraham did the first time, listen to the voice of his wife, he's told to do again. Okay. For in Yitzach, your seed is called. And of the son of the female servant, I also make a nation because he is your seed. And Abraham rose early in the dawn, or morning, and took bread and a skin of water, which he gave to Hagar, bread and water, right, first covenant, okay, which he gave to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, also the boy, and sent her away. And she left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, the wilderness of the well of the oath. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down a bowshot away, for she said, let me not see the death of the boy. And she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And Elohim heard the voice of the boy, and the messenger of Elohim which sometimes in the Hebrew, when you look at that, it just says Melech Elohim. There is no of in the Hebrew language there. Normally to denote of, they would put a sere, two dots that are horizontal underneath the, the, the second to last letter, and then have a yod afterwards. And that would be pronounced a like they, <clears throat> when you ever, you have that at the end of a word, like Benny would be my son. Bene, same spelling, different pronunciation is son of. So Melek, Mel, Mel, what are they? Melake could be the, the messenger of in Hebrew, but I've never seen it written that way anywhere. I don't know if that's a legitimate form or if it was ever used. I'm just telling you the things I am familiar with. Anytime I look at this, you never see the word of or a sere yod used here. So it literally says, and the messenger Elohim. What you do sometimes here, when that is mentioned, it is our Mashiach that is being spoken of. And you can always find that in the context of, of the text there. It might sound like that in this one, because he says, for I make a great nation of him, right? Which is what our Mashiach was the one who was given all authority. But in the, just so you know, in the book of Yobelim, it mentions that a messenger was said and a, the word was spoken to him through the messenger. Sometimes that happens as well, where he will speak through his messengers, his voice, just like the father speaks through him. Okay. But other times, the context is clearly it is not him or it is him. One example is a messenger coming to Daniel that tells him, be strong 
and stand up. And he stood up and he strengthened. He says, oh, keep speaking to me because it's happening. And the only one that speaks with authority that what he says happens is our Mashiach. Right? Or Yahuwah, if you will, who spoke and it came to be. Right? So you, you got to take it with the context of, of what is in Scripture. But right here, I'll just keep reading. And it says, And the messenger of Elohim called to Hagar from the Shamayim, or heavens, and said to her, What is the matter with you, Hagar? Excuse me. All right, sorry about that. So he says, um, he said to her, what is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for Elohim has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Arise, lift up the boy, and hold him with your hand, for I make a great nation of him. And Elohim opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin of water and gave the boy a drink. And Elohim was with the boy. And he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he's also known as a wild donkey man in, in the earlier part of scripture, which if you look at what the donkey represents, it's the stubborn one who won't do what it's told without a bit and bridle. Okay. It represents the first covenant believers. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Mitzrayim. Okay, also where his mother was from. And it came to be, and right, the culture, the, the, the paganism, that's what helped bring it in, right? And it came to be at that time that Abimelech and Picol, the commander of his army, spoke to to Abraham, saying, Elohim is with you in all that you do, and now swear to me by Elohim not to be untrue to me, to my offspring, or to my descendants. Do to me according to the loving kindness that I have done to you and to the land in which you have dwelt. So he's trying to make a covenant with him, all right? to speak truth and to, to be lovingly kind, to do right. And Abraham said, I swear. Which means it, it's applicable to all of his children. Okay. But Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. Okay. So now he's bringing a grievance He's making the, they're trying to ratify the covenant, but he's bringing up a grievance about something that was not lovingly kind or was not done right. Okay. I want you to pay attention because this is, this is how the law works in our country. And it's a founded and established on the principles of scripture. Okay. That is what the common law is. And here's part of where you can see it to go to the one that has offended you with the redress of grievances to try to remedy the situation before bringing it up, right? This is what he's doing. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this deed. Neither did you inform me, nor did I hear until today. So he was reproved for it, but he claims that he had no knowledge of, and there's no way to say he was telling the truth or lying here. You can't judge a man based on your opinion of the things, we have to go by evidence. So we have to take people for what they say because we want to be taken for what we say and we do to others as we want done to us. It's not about anything else, right? Until you can prove it, you do the right thing. But he says, neither did you inform me, meaning he did not make the grievance known, so there could be no redress of it until now, okay? So Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant, and Abraham set seven ewe, or baby lambs, of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what are these seven ewe, or Shiva, right, Shiva, ewe lambs, which you have set by themselves? And he said, Take these seven ewe lambs, or ewe lambs from my hand to be my witness that I have dug this well. 
So not only did he already dig it, right? But now he's giving him seven, which is what an oath is. To seven something is to oath it or to swear an oath, right? To make a covenant, to confirm it. <clears throat> but he says, take these seven ewe lambs from my hand to be my witnesses that I have dug this well. When you look at what the wells mean in the wilderness that have been dug and the staves and the information as is it, is it, as it is identified and explained in what is called the exhortation from the Damascus document, this parable will make a little more sense. The seven ewe lambs, the seven days of creation, right? This, the, the sacrifice of our Mashiach to be his witness that this is you know something he's done. There's a lot that plays into these things again. If you find these parallels, please share them. I don't want to tell everybody and things all the time and just I would I don't want you to just take my word for them. But if you look at it, it's what's evident in his word. Anyone can do that. But it says, so he called that place Be'er Shiva or Be'er Sheba, which means well of the oath, okay, or the seven well. But this is the well of the oath that's mentioned throughout scripture, Beersheba, right? So he called that place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech rose with Picol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And he planted a teramisk tree in Beersheba, and there called in the name of Yahuwah, the everlasting El. And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines many days. That one right there, I believe, is where it says El Olam, which is actually one of the titles that he is written in one of the mines in Egypt that was found in the, the Hebrew there, El Olam. But... Uh, Thank you all for your time. I think that should cover it now. We'll save the rest of what we have for comments and questions, and we'll, we'll continue with this next week. Ob willing, the more we go into these things, it's easier for you guys to see. I highly encourage you, look for the, the parables in the narrative here. See how it relates to what the children were doing. And then if you can, share, you know, let us know. But you all have a wonderful Shabbat and week ahead, and we'll talk to you next time.